And now the July 2023 performance test. California writes its own performance test, but it's very much like the MPT. It's a 90-minute PT. Unlike the essays, the PT does not require you to have overlearned any particular topic of law, but that's because it provides you with cases that give you a very narrow area of law, and you have to essentially create your own schema or outline of the law that applies to this particular case and this particular task. That makes it a bit more difficult than the essays for a lot of people. It also requires you to, in essence, take on an assigned tone and task. Most often, that's a memorandum, either to the court or to the supervising attorney. So it could be an objective memorandum or a persuasive memo depending on whether it's to the supervisor, objective, or the court, persuasive. Next most common, I think, is a letter to the client explaining something. And then, much less frequently, the bar may ask you to write a statute, develop, in other words, develop a piece of law, or create a closing argument or an opening argument. Those are pretty rare. You're always given two sets of materials, the instructions and file and a library. The library is what it sounds like, a library of cases or statutes or both that comprise the entire body of law you are allowed to use in doing the task you've been assigned. The instructions and file starts with basic instructions for the PT and is immediately followed by a memo from your supervisor that lays out for you what you're required to do in this PT. Then there are other materials that you might find in a client file. Let's start with the instructions and file, which is where we always start on the PT on the bar. I will spend little time here because I need to get straight to the organization of the law as quickly as I can. So I see a table of contents that tells me there are instructions, there's a memo from my supervisor, and there's one other document, a reporter's transcript of proceedings. The instructions are generally the same from one PT to another. As you work your practice, you want to look at the instructions, read through them, at least skim through them for every PT you use for practice so that when you come to your bar exam, you'll be so familiar with that page that you won't have to read it thoroughly. You'll notice if anything about the instructions have changed. As I said, generally it's all the same from one bar to another. Notice item two. It tells you where this is set. It's always in the fictional state of Columbia and item two will tell you what the intermediate appellate court is and what the highest court is. So that should they give you more than one case and they in any way conflict, you'll know which one is the binding authority. Other than that, these instructions appear to be the same as they always are. They tell you that you have two sets of materials, that you should spend about half your time on organizing the law, reading through all of the material you've been given and organizing the law so that you can spend the last 45 minutes crafting your answer. The most vital document in here for me now is the memo from the supervisor. It tells me who I am in this performance test, what my role is, what my task is. It's always laid out clearly in this memo from the supervisor. And in this one, I see that we represent Wendy Burke, that this is a dissolution of marriage and it gives me a paragraph summary of what happened in the court, that this is about the value of stock 
the increase in value during the marriage, and who should own the stock, and how should the increase in value be apportioned. Then the second paragraph there, the third paragraph on the page, but the second paragraph of sort of a summary of facts from the supervisor, tells me that although arguments are scheduled in the decision about who should get what part of the increase in value, the other side, the husband's counsel, has offered a deal, a stipulation that would give our client an interest in half of the increase in value. And that interest would be worth $50 million. But if the stock, the increase in value, were to be characterized as community altogether, her share would be $100 million. So the question is, should she accept this deal or not? At the very bottom of the page, you see the supervisor laying out what the task is. He says, please draft a letter to the client responding to her request. Start with a brief statement of your recommendations. Then address and resolve the following issues raised by her request, citing the applicable law and the material facts. So that third paragraph, third major paragraph on this page, is really important because it comes at the bottom of the page and the supervisor is about to list a series of questions to be answered in this letter, it would be really, really easy to ignore the instruction to begin with a brief statement of your recommendations. So I'm going to underline that, circle it, yellow highlight it, whatever I have to do to make that stick out for me. The other thing I'm going to do is either write within this set of materials or preferably on a scratch page, which they give you in the bar, I'm going to outline the structure of the task I'm being given. I'm going to remind myself that it's a letter to the client, that it has to start with a brief statement of recommendation and then it's going to move on to the points the supervisor has raised. If I don't do that for myself, it would be really easy to ignore that brief summary of the recommendation, and that would cost you points because you wouldn't have followed the instruction from the supervisor. And then, once I've highlighted all that, on the next page I see the three points the supervisor wants me to address and answer. The first one is, should those shares be characterized as community property or separate property? Second, did the community devote more than minimal effort involving Harlan's shares during marriage? And the third, how should the family court apportion the $200 million increase in value during marriage? So I mark each of those, highlight the relevant phrases. I know this seems like overkill, but by the time you have read through the library and outlined the law, you need to be able to quickly go back and make sure that you are applying facts to the right points of law to answer these questions. So I'm spending time on this supervisor's memo now to ensure that I strictly follow the instructions. If I don't, I'll lose five or ten points right off the top of that score no matter how good my writing is and how well I apply the law. I have to follow the supervisor's instructions and format. Now that I know what the task is, I move to the library. I know it's tempting to read the rest of the file, but if you read the rest of the file now, you're reading facts without a legal context to decide what's legally relevant. So you have to outline the structure of the law before you dig into detailed facts, because you have to have the law to line the facts up with. So the only other thing I'm going to do in this instructions and file right now is really briefly skim 
what they've given me in the other document, the transcript, to see if there's anything the crafters of this PT have highlighted in there, like some instruction from the judge or some stipulated facts or something that's, that's really highlighted that I want to pay attention to while I'm reading the law. So that's what we'll do next before we go into the library. But as I said, a really brief skim. I'm looking down these pages, resisting the temptation to dig into the facts out of context. But now I see four numbered points, and I'm going to pay attention. This is a stipulation from both sides. And there are four points to the stipulation, and I'm going to pay attention to that briefly for a moment here so that I have that in mind when I organize the law. The first two points give me the date of founding the company and the date they issued the stock. The third point says after that, Harlan and Wendy married. The fourth point says that in 2000. Nine, when they filed for divorce, the stock had increased in value to $200 million from a starting value of zero. That's the context for me reading the law. And I see nothing else that's highlighted in the rest of this transcript, so I'm going to move on to the library and get the law. In the library, I see that there's only one case. In re marriage of Rand. And of course you know when you cite this case in your final answer, you don't need the whole cite. You just call it Rand and that will be fine. Don't waste time trying to do beautiful blue book cites. It's not necessary. So what do we have here? We have a case that has facts that are right on point for what we need to do, of course. That's what you always get in a library. So this is about stocks. It's about stocks that appreciated in value throughout the course of a marriage and how should those appreciations be apportioned. So we have facts here. We see that this is separate property. They were acquired before marriage. And the court is going to go through and thoroughly analyze the character of the stocks and how their appreciation should be apportioned during the course of the marriage. So I'm highlighting a few things here just to remind me that these facts are about separate property stocks. But what I really want out of this case is the law. I want to outline the legal principles that I need to use to analyze my facts. I'm taking note here that what the court is summarizing seems to be the level of involvement the separate property owner had in those stocks during the course of the marriage. When did he work night and day? when did he basically withdraw from any involvement in the stocks. And I'm paying attention to that because I expect the facts in my file to be similar, to have some level of involvement by the husband, and that will be legally relevant. But so far, I haven't seen any straight legal principles. Here at the top of the page, I see a summary of what the trial court decided about the stocks, their character as separate property, and then the court seems to have divided the interest in the appreciation into two time frames, one of which they determined was community and the other was separate. I'm paying attention to that, but again, I'm also looking through this case to find rules of law that I can lay down in my analysis and apply my facts to. Now finally, under the discussion, I find some rules that I need, that marriage is an egalitarian partnership. There's a definition of 
property that either spouse acquires during marriage belongs to the marital community, it's community property. And then in contrast, property that either spouse acquired before marriage belongs to that spouse. It's his or her separate property. Those rules I know I need. Next, the court tells us that the proceeds of property that either spouse acquired before marriage also belong to the acquiring spouse as separate property. You knew that before you started this PT, but you can't use your own law. You have to find the rules within the cases in the performance test. So this goes on to give us the rule for appreciation during the course of marriage and says that whenever the community provides more than minimal effort in that separate property, then the community has some level of interest in the appreciation. So on this page, I've found pretty much all of the basic rules I think I need to decide what's what with m the facts in my file. What else is this case going to offer me? I move on to the next page and I see that in dividing property at dissolution, the court must apportion the increase in value during marriage of one spouse's separate property whenever the community devotes more than minimal effort. Ah, and now the court is going to discuss the apportionment that comes out of Pereira when the community has given more than minimal effort. Then, I expect in the next paragraph to find an analysis of Van Camp, a summary of that, when the increase in value during marriage is primarily due to something other than community effort. So I have both rules here on this page. The other thing I see down here that I want to highlight because it would be a good general principle to get in my answer is that the court, in apportioning, the court must divide the property in such a way as to achieve substantial justice between the spouses. That's a really good quote to get in my answer. So the rest of what I see on this page is the court applying those rules to the facts in the case in this library and that it's undisputed that the community devoted effort more than minimal effort. The court also says that it doesn't matter which spouse it was. It, it really doesn't matter whether the non-acquiring spouse devoted effort or not because when either spouse devotes effort, it's community effort. The community acts when either of the spouses acts. I have a feeling that rule is going to be important. There may be some controversy about which of, of our parties put in the effort. I don't know yet because I haven't looked at those facts that carefully, but I'm marking this. So then the rest of this on the last page of the case is about the fact that substantial justice requires that the court evenly divide only the portion of the appreciation that is due to community effort. So I'm marking that as well. And now I think it's time to go back and look at the facts in the file and line them up with this law. So I'm going to start by reminding myself what those stipulated facts are. And there is what I had highlighted before, that they married in 1989 and that they separated in 2009. And over the course of that time frame, the value of the stocks went from $0 to $200 million. What do we have in the rest of this transcript? And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time digging into these facts with you. You can go to the CalBar website and pull the entire file and library and read those facts in detail for yourself. I do note that the court is interested in why Mrs. Burke waited, I think it's 12 years, to file for dissolution of marriage and it's because she had raised four children and was not 
interested in remarrying, but now she is interested. Okay, I'm not sure what I'm going to use that for, but the court asked about it, so I'm paying attention. So what they give us is a husband who formed a company with a friend before marriage and worked night and day at it. And the company, of course, became quite successful. They give us a lot of facts that go to the level of effort the husband put in, working night and day. He was the science officer for the company, and he developed the product that changed the entire marketplace. And after he married our client, he continued to work night and day on this company, on this business. So I have facts there that tell me that this is separate property stock and that the appreciation, at least so far in this transcript, is community because it's due to the husband's effort and time. In other words, the community effort and time. So far it's very straightforward. The husband worked at this company throughout the entire course of the marriage. There must be something more complex coming up. It can't be this straightforward. But so far I'm not seeing anything that jumps out at me that would change the analysis. There's some discussion about whether our client ever worked for the business, uh, but that's really going to be irrelevant as long as he was devoting community effort to the business. There's discussion about why our client didn't uh, hire nannies and take advantage of the fact that they were able to afford help and she could have had a career and all that sort of stuff. Um, she says she preferred to raise her children herself, especially since he was working night and day at the company. So far I'm not seeing any big twist or complication in the analysis, but go on to the examination of the partner in the business. And what do we have here? As we read through her direct testimony and then her cross-examination, we see that without Harlan, the business wouldn't have come into existence and it would not have remained in existence. He was always working very strong evidence for us that the appreciation is community. So where is the complication here? Where does this become more difficult? Ah, so here on this page we see that the company had two main products. Digital audio with which our client's husband designed, developed, and basically was the be-all and end-all for producing and keeping on the market. And then the technology changed and their product was pro audio. And he had nothing to do with pro audio. So the question is, how could he have been vital to the continued existence of the company if he didn't have anything to do with pro audio? And her reply is that it had a rocky start and that he had to continue to tweak digital audio in order to keep things going until they could get that product up and running. They do not give us a date when Pro Audio became the product that was making money for the company, but she says he was always working at 110%. So although his product ceased to be important to the company, he continued to put effort into the company, and I would argue that that made all the appreciation in the stock be community. So now before I start crafting my answer, I need to look at what the request from the supervisor was. And so I go back and I look at the fact that I need to summarize the recommendation and I need to address three issues. The characterization of the stock itself, how much community effort was put in, and how should the court apportion. Now my job is to accomplish this task, which I think is a bit more difficult than a straight memo. 
I'm asked to draft a letter to the client advising her whether we think she should accept their offer or not. Their offer is to have half of the appreciation be characterized as community, the other half be characterized as separate, which means she would get $50 million. If we were to take this to, to trial, reject the offer, then she stands to get as much as a hundred million dollars. So what it comes down to is how strong do we think our case is and how desperate is this client for the money right now. And you have to address all that in your recommendations. They throw you a bit of a, a, a curve in that they tell you that she says she's barely making it right now. But they also tell you that her children are grown. She raised them. So presumably she was barely making it for all of those 12 years. Nothing has really changed as far as I can see. So in your letter to her, my recommendation would be that we should take this to court. We should reject the offer because she has an excellent chance of getting well more than $50 million when the court apportions. However, she should understand that it will be a long fight and that there are no guarantees and you have to get all that across to her. The court has discretion. So this will depend on how well we prove that he put effort into this company the entire time that they were married. Writing a letter to the client is, I think, more complicated than simply an objective or a persuasive memo because you have to counsel her about the risks of turning down this offer and the benefits and make it clear that it is ultimately the client's own choice because she sets the goals. So now, if you've made it this far in this video, which is quite long, then what I need to hear from you is whether you are having difficulty with the performance test and whether you would like to see a detailed example of how to take what we've issue spotted it in here and turn it into an, a written answer. Are you doing okay with the performance test? What else can we do to help you with that?